My name is Andrea Lindblom and I will be moderating this event as Björn Ula Linnea, who you will have been expecting, unfortunately fell sick. And so we wish him a speedy recovery from here. Mining is a hot topic because the extraction of minerals and metals is so central to the low carbon transition that we have to succeed with to avoid catastrophic global warming. The needs and interests of local communities are concerned and discussed, but not necessarily addressed in the context of coal mine closures and a just transition away from fossil fuels. So mining comes up quite a lot in debates about climate mitigation. Today, we want to focus on climate adaptation and on mining and the question of who among the actors in the mining sector perceives which risks from climate change, who is affected by which risks and who does what to adapt to these risks and who needs to do more and maybe better to ensure that local communities in mining regions don't get to bear the brunt of the impacts of climate risks nor that of adaptation responses. So stay tuned for presentations from and discussions with Anthony Bebbington, International Program Director for Natural Resources and Climate Change at the Ford Foundation. Veronica Martinez, Lead Strategist for Innovation and Climate Change at the International Council on Mining and Metals. And Krishna Maturi, Global Mining and Climate Advisory Lead in the Natural Resources and Infrastructure Department of the International Finance Corporation, IFC. Welcome to all of you. Anthony, Veronica and Krishna will present on different aspects of this complex debate and you in the audience will have the opportunity to post questions in the Q&A function in the right hand side of your screen up there. And just so everyone is aware, this webinar is recorded and it will be published on the Mistra Geopolitics website. Let's hold our horses on these uh, Q&A questions for now. We'll first hear from Maria Therias Gustafsson, Associate Professor at Stockholm University, and Isabella Strindeval, a research assistant also at Stockholm University, whose report, Climate Risks and Community Resilience in the Mining Sector, was funded by Mistra Geopolitics, an SEI-hosted research program. Welcome, Maria Therese and Isabella, and a very warm welcome to Anna George, Program Manager for Environmental Governance Programs at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, who I will now hand over to for welcoming remarks. Over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Andrea. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, the reason I'm here is because the study of climate risks and mining, which is in focus today, was originally initiated within the Environmental Governance Programme, which is a global development programme jointly implemented by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and UNDP and financed by CEDA. Uh, and uh, the Environmental Governance Program focuses on integrating human rights and the environment into the mining sector governance, uh, which also has many relations to the issues that will be discussed today. So why the mining sector? Our society needs metals and minerals, as Andrea just mentioned, including for the technologies we need to power the green transition. But mining also has a big environmental and social footprint, and it includes air, soil and water pollution, biodiversity loss and human rights impacts on health, livelihood and more. And many of these mines are in the developing countries with weak governance, fragility and conflict, and they are vulnerable to climate risks such as rising water levels or lack of clean waters. And often it's those already facing poverty, vulnerability and exclusion who suffer the negative impacts. As the invite to today's meeting says, this situation is likely to be reinforced by climate change and there is a need for discussing climate risks in relation to mining. And also how stakeholders such as governments and private companies can act responsibly and how communities can increase their participation and influence. So I am really looking forward to the presentations and to this discussion today. And I now leave the floor to Maria Therese Gustafsson. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, I will now present our research. So currently the effects of climate change are being widely felt around the world. Increasingly private actors, not just within the mining industry, are seeking to adapt to the physical risk posed by climate change. From extractive industries, we have recent disasters, such as the collapse from, of the Brumadinho Dam in 2019, and also the Norilsk Nickel oil spill from 2020. And these examples serve as a reminder of the importance of adapting to critical infrastructure as extreme weather events become more frequent and severe. Private adaptation responses may have significant impact, both positive and negative, on society. It is therefore important, we argue, to seek to understand how private companies choose to adapt to climate change. And in this presentation, we will present our findings from research that we have carried out over the past two years. We have analyzed climate adaptation initiatives from the largest global mining companies and existing regulation of such initiatives. The overarching purpose is to identify governance gap and to reflect upon entry points for building community resilience in the context of mining and climate change. So climate change is are highly relevant for the mining sector. Mineral extraction is critical for the low carbon transition, as Anna mentioned, but is also an important driver of deforestation and thus contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. But there is less, much less discussions about climate adaptation in the mining sector. Mining projects are at the same time very vulnerable to climate risk, such as when we think about water scarcity or extreme weather events. Water is uh, often a critical problem in the context of mining and often leads to conflicts between local communities and companies. Next slide. Many countries which are dependent on mining are also highly vulnerable to climate risk. And this map shows how mining dependency intersects with climate vulnerability. And mining dependency is represented by using the different patterns um, that are illustrated in the box to the left and climate vulnerabilities illustrated by the brown color. The cross pattern is the most mining dependent countries and the countries that are illustrated in dark brown are the most vulnerable to climate risks. And as illustrated by this map, we can see that many mining dependent countries are sensitive to climate risk. For instance, countries in the Sahel region, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, but also countries such as Peru. And this map indicates that an increasing demand for minerals and metals such as cobalt, lithium, bauxite may bring new challenges to countries which are already highly vulnerable to climate change. Next slide. So the purpose of our report is to generate policy relevant knowledge about how climate risks are addressed by mining companies and provide for an overview of the existing regulations. And the overarching goal is to understand how community rights and needs could be better protected in mining regions that are exposed to climate risk. And for this purpose, we analyzed how the largest 37 mining companies address climate risk. And we carried out over 50 interviews with representatives of companies, state agencies and civil society actors. And we also analyzed how climate risks in the mining sector are regulated in countries such as Canada, Mongolia, Peru and South Africa. Next slide. So this table shows how many co mining companies have addressed climate risk. A little bit more than half of the companies in our sample have started to address climate risks. We distinguish between institutional, infrastructural and community oriented responses. The institutional responses refer to the integration of climate risk in water governance and risk management framework, frameworks. And this is the most common response. With adapting to technology and infrastructure through infrastructure responses is um, the second most common response. The least common response is the community oriented responses, which refers to activities that primarily or partially aim at enhancing adaptive capacity of local communities. About 26% of the companies reported upon uh, such initiatives. 
More generally, our findings reveal that communities are generally not invited to participate in risk assessment and community vulnerability is rarely considered in companies' risk management frameworks. So while only about half of the companies report on addressing climate risks, most of these companies have taken a, a sort of technical approach to climate adaptation, aiming to build um, business resilience, but not but to, to much less extent community resilience. The next slide. So we also looked at, uh, analyzed to what extent companies disclose information and involve local communities and engaged in multi-stakeholder initiatives focused on climate adaptation. And we found whereas 61% disclose information towards investors and shareholders, uh, only 90% of the companies disclose, uh, share this information with state agencies and local communities according to their reporting. Um, companies generally stress that local communities do not understand highly technical climate risk, so it's perceived as a, as a challenge to, to, to work more, uh, to engage in climate adaptation. And moreover, climate risk are often dealt with by engineers from the company's environmental units rather than community relationship teams. And the lack of involvement of local communities in the development of climate risk responses imply that companies potentially overlook how their adaptation responses are impacting on upon local communities or how uh, and how the adaptation responses could be designed in a way to to reduce trade-offs and, and bring about more mutual benefits. Um, so now I will pass the word to Isabella for the second half of the presentation. Um, Thank you, Maria Tres. We can change the slide, please. So on this note, we have also analyzed the extent to which climate is integrated in key mine governance instruments in Canada, Mongolia, Peru, and South Africa. And we have focused on in particular four governance tools, environmental impact assessments, water use licenses, tailing standards, and closure plans. Despite that known sustainability challenges may be greatly exacerbated by climate change, we find that in general, there are few legal requirements to take climate action or climate risks into account in these governance tools. Conversely, mining is rarely mentioned in adaptation policies, such as national adaptation plans. This lack of policy integration means that there is limited information and institutional procedures for handling the combined effects of mining and climate risks. Next slide, please. Despite the absence of legal requirements, different types of guidance and voluntary standards have recently emerged. For example, the Canadian Impact Assessment Act of 2019 requires considerations of how a proposed project will impact the country's commitment on climate change. The Peruvian Ministry of Environment has developed voluntary guidelines on integrating climate risks in the EIA process, and there are progressive industry standards on mine closure, tailings management and water stewardship. However, voluntary initiatives are likely to be selectively enforced by companies which may impact the effectiveness of enforcement and compliance. We see that the push for adaptation is largely driven by investors rather than civil society and governments, which means that companies are more incentivized to cater to the investment community than local stakeholders, which may come at the expense of local sustainability. In interviews, company representatives often associate this lack of civil society pressure on climate adaptation with the limited knowledge on climate issues among local communities. Climate change is often measured and communicated using a very technical language, in addition to being addressed by engineers rather than community relations personnel. This may further limit effective dialogue and participation on climate issues. Next slide. In response to the shortcomings of voluntary frameworks, a number of European countries have recently adopted mandatory due diligence legislation, which builds on the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or UNGPs for short. The UNGPs established that companies, regardless of size and sector, should carry out human rights due diligence in their value chain. This demand has, however, been modified in various ways in different legal frameworks across Europe. The UNDPs and much of recent legislation has been criticized for failing to incorporate environmental considerations and for taking a more traditional stance towards human rights. 
New laws that are being debated within both EU member states and at the EU level are increasingly integrating both human rights and environmental issues. And these laws could contribute to integrate community rights in corporate climate actions. Next slide. While community participation appears to be limited in existing corporate adaptation responses, we find the most advanced initiatives in the context of water governance. For example, there is an emerging trend of catchment water stewardship, which is developed in collaboration with effective water users across the whole water catchment. This opens up for establishing dialogues among multiple stakeholders on climate related water risks. Participatory environmental monitoring, where community members are involved in collecting information about their adjacent environments, is also a potential tool for increasing the participation of local communities in climate risk initiatives. When such initiatives are designed and driven by community members, they may serve as a valuable tool to foster trust, enhance transparency and accountability, and ultimately mitigate environmental degradation associated with mining. Next slide. So this brings us to the conclusions. Private adaptation is gaining traction in the mining industry and elsewhere. It is mainly driven by investor requirements, whereas pressures from governments and civil society organizations are weak. Governments have a key role to play, both to incentivize companies to prioritize climate action and to develop responses in collaboration with local stakeholders. It would be important to integrate climate considerations in key mine governance instruments that we have talked about. International organizations such as the UNFCCC and the UNDP can support the abilities of developing countries to improve upon climate adaptation governance and the EU plays an important role in improving corporate sustainability standards, for example, through mandatory due diligence requirements. Next slide. With that note, I would like to close this presentation and I look forward to the following or coming speaker presentations and the following panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella Strindeval, and to Maria Therese Gustafsson before you. And um, while this, this presentation and your research, I think, sparks many questions, um, I would urge the audience that we have to put these questions in the Q&A function up there on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, while, and we'll, we'll aim to get to these questions at the end uh, of this webinar in the last 15 minutes. Now we'd like to go straight to Anthony Bevington who will uh, zero in on the question of what is required to avoid that mining affected communities bear a disproportionate burden in this context where climate risks and mining coincide. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you and thanks for the invitation. Um, before starting to address this question, I should make an important caveat. Although I grew up in a coal mining region, I am not a community member. And so most important would be to hear from a range of community members, women, men, young, old, disabled, able-bodied, indigenous, non-indigenous, town and dwelling, rural dwelling, regarding their views on the question. But with that noted, I want to make five responses or five observations in response to the question that was posed to me. The first observation is that while there are different ways in which communities are burdened by the intersection of mining and climate risk, I think it's helpful to distinguish two scenarios in which this occurs. One scenario is where the presence of mining will aggravate the impacts of climate change on communities, whether by using water, introducing new risks into the landscape, such as tailing dams, or by reducing community asset bases that could otherwise serve as resources for adaptation and resilience. A second scenario, which may be co-present with the first, is where communities are impacted by the mining of transition minerals needed to build decarbonized energy systems. In this scenario, the climate related risks faced by communities become double. They derive from risks of climate change in situ and also derive from climate change mitigation initiatives in other geographies, usually from more privileged groups and more privileged places. In the worst version of this scenario, communities are simply treated as sacrifice zones. So that's an opening gambit observation. The second observation I'd like to make 
is the following. The question posed to me must immediately raise another question, namely, what is a proportionate burden? There is a presumption here that communities should bear any burden at all, but why? Grounds have to be established to make that argument, especially if those making this claim are not community members. We cannot assume that there is any such thing as a proportionate burden. Third, and closely related to this second observation, what would be the process for determining what a proportionate burden might be? Several months ago, I was in a meeting on just transitions, at which a senior executive of a global mining company asked out loud, almost agonized out loud, how do we get them to understand that the mining of critical minerals is essential and urgent? I would suggest that even if questions of urgency are indeed real, a process for determining proportionate burden cannot be one in which the question asked is, how can we get communities to understand? Asking the question that way does two things. It casts communities as ignorant and unreasonable. And second, it departs from an asymmetric relationship in which imaginable persuasion is only running in one direction. It presumes from the outset that one party in the conversation is in the right and knows best and the other does not. So I want to suggest my second observation, sorry, my third observation, that while asymmetries in the relationships between mining companies and communities are never going to disappear, arriving at a view on proportionate burden must involve discussions that are as symmetric as possible. Fourth observation. One essential prerequisite for such symmetry is strong civic space. Yet civic space is under pressure. Civicus's 2021 State of the Civil Society report concludes that 87% of the world's population lives with severe restrictions on civic space. These restrictions limit the ability of communities, their leaders and their allies to assert their voice regarding what constitutes proportionate burden. While there are many dimensions and indicators of this reduced civic space, let me note just two that are directly related to mining. The first, is the use by mining companies and their allies of strategic litigation against public participation or slap suits. These lawsuits seek to silence voices and constrain public debate. Between 2015 and 2021, the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, a grantee of Ford Foundation, identified 355 cases brought by business actors that bear the hallmarks of slap suits. Fully 108 of those cases were related to mining. A second indicator of this closing civic space is the killing of environmental defenders. The global witness figure that on average four environmental defenders are killed each week merits repeating again and often because it's simply appalling. Many of these defenders have been killed in the context of mining disputes and many, many more endure intimidation. The implication is that getting to symmetric agreement on proportionate burden requires the protection and the enhancement of civic space. Mining companies should either defer from operating in environments of acutely constrained civic space or maybe constrained civic space at all, and or should use their voice and their resources to protect and strengthen civic space. This is not to ask companies be, to be political. It is merely to ask them to be human. And my fifth and closing observation is that approaching a view on proportionate burden should be done with a recognition of historical context in two senses that I want to note here. First is history in place, in which it is recognized that new burdens may well compound prior historically accumulated burdens. That history of burdens might be so great as to suggest that no new burden could ever be considered proportionate. And second is to recognize the colonial nature of mining. The bulk of contemporary mining is caught up in colonial relationships and is interpreted by many communities through the lens of having been perpetually colonized. To keep ever present the recognition that mining is colonial is of course not in and of itself a solution. It is, however, a disposition that will have enormous bearing or should have enormous bearing on any ideas of proportionality of burden. So thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation.
Thank you so much indeed, Anthony, and thank you for, for bringing in this historical perspective and widen our focus a little bit from the here and now. You mentioned asymmetries in the relationships between mines and communities and the need for more um, symmetric discussions, not only, but also about climate risks and risk management. So who would have to do what to contribute to more symmetric relationships and maybe with a, with a view to, to the clock? Who is that one actor that would have to do something to ensure that mining affected communities don't get to bear the brunt of both climate risks and mining? Um, I mean, having in on what that one, just one actor is tricky, but I mean, in a general sense, I would say that the answer to that question is not what colloquially you might say in England, it's not rocket science. I think we know this. this we know it from prior experience. So the sorts of things that would be needed are free prior and informed consent processes, general guarantees of rights that go beyond free prior and informed consent, um, much more durable and demanding standards of benefit sharing that are not simply as forms of compensation, but forms of sharing the benefits that flow from the subsoil, um, and forms of legislation that would regulate all that and that would also protect communities and populations that live in areas that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. In some sense, you might argue that the legislation in El Salvador is a case of that. So within that, within that group of four, and I, I maybe would mention another couple after that, um, there are clear roles for government and clear roles for companies. But I think at the core, and this came up in the presentation that was made of the study, at the core of that is the, well, I think two things were at the core. One is the part P and I part of FPIC, the prior and informed. So the presentation talks a lot about how mining companies see communities as ill-informed, inadequately informed, and poor mining companies, that complicates their work. But I think the implication is there is an awful lot of work that needs to be done prior, well prior, in providing information that's intelligible and accessible to communities to be able to make their own calculations of proportionate burden. Um, the other thing that I emphasize is, is benefit sharing. I think, and this becomes both a national and a multilateral set of obligations that the benefit sharing question between climate vulnerable communities and mining is in some sense, particularly when you take the historical context into consideration, is in some sense a micro version of the broader argument about loss and damage. And so at that, at that level, multilateral commitments to loss and damage also become important. And then there's a whole set of roles for civil society organizations also to helping on issues of prior and inf prior information on providing support on how to negotiate, on providing legal support. Um, but I've had too many acts. I've, I've done more than one actor already, so I'll stop with that. And we're a little bit um, uh, running over time. Um, just a brief explanation for those that are not familiar with this term. Loss and damage is actually a sort of a one one very contentious topic of negotiations under the UN framework Convention on Climate Change, um, where uh, the question really is of whether developed countries um, come up with a new and additional money um, for those communities that face losses and damages from climate impacts that they have not been able and that they could not adapt to um, anymore. So where money for uh, climate adaptation really um, is, is not good enough or uh, is too late. Um, let's not dwell on this. Um, we now go to Veronica Martinez speaking for the International Council on Mining and Metals to address the question of how private adaptation initiatives can be designed to bring mutual co-benefits to corporations and to communities alike. Over to you, Veronica. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I'll try to answer this question. <laughs> I don't think I have a, a full answer, but uh, thanks for inviting me and really happy to be here. Um, next slide, please. 
Thank you. And next one. Yeah. I just wanted to, to start my presentation with a really quick and brief introduction of ICMM because maybe some um, people in the audience are not aware of our existence. So we are the International Council on Mining and Metals and we bring together 26, seven around <laughs> mining companies um, that represent around a third of the global metals um, and mining you know, market. Um, we are a leadership organization and we are we, our objective is to um, promote responsibly, responsible mining, uh, responsibly produce minerals and metals uh, that can help and support, you know, a, a a safe, just and sustainable world. You can see the logos of our company, member companies there on the screen. And in addition to these companies, you know, probably as Maria Therese was mentioning that you interview the 37 largest mining companies in the world, probably a lot of them um, are here. And, and in addition to these companies, we also have over 35 national commodity association as, me as members, and they help us to expand the outreach of our work. And we believe, and we are as a leadership organization that that we um, are, are hoping to achieve, of course, a positive impact of the industry to enhance the contribution of the mining and metals companies to support sustainable development. Um, we have a set of mining uh, principles, a set of performance expectations, and a quite several long list of commitments that our member companies need to um, conform with in order to be part of ICMM. And all of these commitments are around uh, responsible mining from you know, governance, transparency, health and safety, human rights, etc. cetera. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have 12 areas of focus. And also when I was listening to the previous um, speakers, I was thinking that, um, and, and this is part of our new strategy, the new strategy for the next three years of ICMM, but also is how we can overcome silos, right? So how we make, you know, engineers talking to community, but practitioners that, you know, they are the ones engaging with host communities, etc. And we are facing that challenge internally at ICMM as well on how we can, you know, connect projects and programs much better. Um, so you'll see here on, on the screen that we have well four big areas um, and 12 projects uh, and we're trying to we're, we're working on that as speak to make it as interconnected as possible. So of course one big area is climate and environmental resilience where we're covering there a lot of the topics that you have mentioned around water stewardship, biodiversity, etc. Then we have social and of course, climate and climate mitigation and, and that social performance where we have, um, you know, diversity uh, inclusion. Uh, we have an initiative that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be mentioning a little bit later around skills for the future, something that um, Anthony was mentioning as well in part, as part of the just transition. Um, governance transparency, um, a lot of, you know, how mining companies are responding to standards, our, our you know, standards and, you know, external uh, standards to support transparency and accountability and finally which probably is more my area you know climate and innovation but how we can create new product processes and approaches so not, not only um the you know the innovation that's you know technology innovation etc but all the social innovation that can uh, significant um, enable significant progress in all of them in mean, the, the challenges that the sector is facing so i'll just go quickly like kind of do a deep dive on what we're doing on the next slide on, on, on the climate project. So, of course, um, our focus on, on the climate project of ICMM is mitigation, as you were saying, you know, priority, and probably because it's a more um, understood area and there's more kind of clear pathways for implementation on how the industry reduces GHG emissions along its value chain. And not by far saying that this is kind of the low hanging fruit or, or that there is any quick win on mitigation because there are many, many challenges that companies are facing, but uh, probably that's why where you know the traction comes from. Um, and then we have adaptation, so how the industry builds short and long term operational and business resilience, supported host communities and disclosure. Um, so how the industry discloses climate related information in a standardized way. So all these three areas are summarized in our climate change position statement that we launched back in October 2021. In this climate change position statement, we have, of course, a net zero commitment uh, where all member companies are committing to net zero. Um, but also I think there are a few other commitments that are quite relevant for this discussion. So for example, Marie Therese was, um, or 
Isabella, sorry, I don't, I don't remember who was, but you were mentioning about the, the, the standard or for example, TCFD or that are volunteer, right? Um, you know, um, and, and with this commitment, for example, all of our member companies have committed to report against TCFT. So we're trying to make that a space for in making things volunteer a little bit narrower for companies. So all of them are, are report, and, and that of course will force company, almost half of our members are already reporting against TCFT, but it's bringing up to speed, you know, those that are a little bit behind and make them of course. And when you go into the TCFT structure, of course, you will need to assess climate uh, risks uh, and opportunities and not only physical risks, but also transition risks that for the mining sector, I think they're quite particular. So in this process and we have started, you know, developing and tools and resources to support our member companies on the adaptation bit because of course it's a little bit more uncertain uh, understanding the impacts of climate change you really need to get into the climate scenarios the modeling and that could be a little bit tricky right so next slide please so we have de uh, developed some resources uh, just are just a few examples in in i think it was late 2019 early 2022 2020 sorry um, uh, we release a report on adapting to climate change, building resilience in the mining and metals industry. And, you know, the mining uh, industry has, you know, it's very, very well positioned in terms of risk management and, and, and risk assessment. But this was uh, the, the objective of this report was to bring on the climate, you know, lens into the risk management. So uh, this report is available. Maybe I can put it on, on the chat afterwards, the link to access to this report, but um, it's based on the experience experiences of kind of um, our members because you know let's be real a lot of mining companies are already facing the physical impacts of climate change so we are trying to promote of course a proactive approach but you know to be completely honest there's a lot of reactive uh, you know uh, measures being uh, built right now and other experts you know providing you know an overview on how you know, this changing climate could impact the sector and identifying ways that mining can mining companies can in integrate climate change into risk management processes and you know it lays out a little bit of a process how to build um, climate resilience understanding that this is an iterative project because of the course there's a lot of a lot of uncertainties and also um, the mic tool is a tool that is available for our members because when we're thinking okay what are the impacts in 2050 or climate change 2030 or etc then you really need to get into you know climate scenarios climate models and to be honest mining companies you know they don't have the capacity you know the internal capacity to to really get into this so what we did here was um build a georeference platform that integrates a lot of the available climate models um so now you mining companies get in there so it's kind of a one-stop shop really for that first early assessment on what are the climate uh, risks in that particular area so you could put the coordinates of a specific asset and it will give you kind of the physical risks uh, and the physical threats uh, to that operation so it could be water you know scarcity scarcity water abundance you know more you know more the higher frequency of extreme weather events etc so these are a little bit kind of the tools that we are we have been developing over the past few years to support mining companies to really understand what they need to do to adapt to this changing climate, considering all the levels of intensity that, that there, there is, but also how we can bring this understanding into host communities as well. So my final slide, and I will go very lightly on this because of course it is outside a little bit of, of my skills, but I think it was really important to mention, and as Anthony was mentioning these two scenarios and that host communities can be phased to this or can fit into to these two scenarios of you know the physical risk and also the transition risks of, of climate. So we have a, an initiative called Skills for Our Common Future that aims to support community resilience through skills delivery and partnership. So of course this initiative is not only focused on climate because if we're thinking about the future there are a lot of other trends that can impact you know the community for example digitalization automation and how this impacts you know the, the, the future of you know host communities of the mining sector. Um, usually at ICMM we work with commitments or goals that can you know inspire our members to you know get action moving 
Um, so that we have a, a social goal in this case is that um, all of our member companies committed to work collaborative over, you know, this is a kind of a long term goal to build skills for our communities to fully participate in the economy of the future. So this means um, and this initiative is actually led by, you know, community practitioners, co people that have a lot of strong um, experience on, on community. So I'm going to wrap it up there because I know we're a little bit behind on schedule, but um, happy to follow up later on, on Q&A. Thank you so much, Veronica. And, and as we are a little bit um, behind um, schedule, hopefully you would have a fairly brief answer to what unfortunately is still quite an, an open question. Um, but on your slide there, um, that showed mitigation and adaptation. Of course, you know, you had mitigation right uh, up top and then adaptation sort of follows. And I'd like to understand a little bit better what maybe then the the um, the biggest uh, challenge is with mining companies focusing more on adaptation and resilience and in particular, not just business resilience, but community resilience. Yeah, I think I think I don't have a kind of a direct answer to that because I think it's still an ongoing challenge. So I, I would love to say that we have found a way to do this, but but we are really aware that this, in, this is an area where we need to do more. And actually, it's part of our commitments in the climate change position statement to engage with host communities to understand and help them to prepare better for those physical risks of, of climate change. But I think there are quite a few examples already that mining companies are already doing this. So, for example, in my home country in Chile, mining companies are already incorporating host communities when thinking about, for example, desalination water plants to include the needs of you know, communities into, you know, because water scarcity is one of the biggest you know, impacts in that area. And there are other examples in other regions of the world, of course. But how we can do this more of a, um, at that scale and not isolated examples. So we're working there, but really I think the past few years have been really about how to understand those impacts. So it's not only that you get this reactive approach, oh, this is an impact, this was an extreme storm, et cetera, and how do we, we can create resilience based on that, but also how we can be a little bit more proactive. And that, that's why we have developed these sort of tools. But I think it's still an ongoing challenge. We are, as I said, as part of the Skills for Common Future initiative, we're trying to connect those two, kind of the more technical bit about, you know, the impact, the models, et cetera, but also with a community. Bit. So hopefully, you know, and this interconnection and um, overcoming the silos, We'll, we'll show it results in, in a couple of years. Thank you so much, Veronica. Now we will go straight to Krishna Maturi from the International Finance Corporation, IFC, who answers the question of what role international financial institutions can play in promoting community resilience in the context of climate change. Krishna. Thank you, Andre, and thanks everybody for, uh, for being here, and uh, it's a great honor. So to directly answer your, your question, uh, a huge role. As enablers of private sector, uh, financial institutions have a critical role to play in ensuring companies are contributing positively to climate action and are becoming them, themselves becoming agents of change. So creating strong incentives to develop and implement ambitious and robust sustainability strategies is a good place to start. So what does it mean in practice? Especially for carbon intensive sectors uh, up and down the mining valley chain, for instance, mining, energy, transport, rapid decarbonization plans um, to align with 1.5 degree scenarios, um, building community resilience through their operations, and just transitions to a low carbon economy, low carbon future um, would be um, would be uh, would be good strategies to, to to begin with. So as a financial institutions, um, we have uh, we have to make sure that they have robust targets, plans to get to their targets and financial incentives to get the, get to meet those targets. So um, next slide, please. I'm going to introduce uh, a program that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, it's a World Bank uh, group-wide program. It's called Climate Smart Mining. Uh, through Climate Smart Mining, it was born out of a report that was published in 2017 how uh, that focused on uh, looking at the um, uh, how low carbon economy is going to be uh, minerally mineral intensive, and followed by a report in 2020 looking at uh, the emission intensity of these low carbon, uh, the metals and minerals that are critical for low carbon economy. So uh, next slide, please. 
and uh, climate smart mining initiative is uh, governed by uh, of, of, uh, four building blocks of verticals that uh, look at climate mitigation, climate resilience, circular economy, and creating markets, uh, market opportunities in, in the critical mineral space. So uh, what does this do? I mean, beyond the definition that you're looking at the screen, uh, what we do in this space is both IFC and World Bank, uh, World Bank um, or World Bank operations, we try to create knowledge uh, and um, analytical products that can be used um, within these four building blocks with the cross cutting um, themes as gender and innovation um, being being the themes to uh, create uh, create knowledge and, and uh, analytical products to be used in our uh, lending operations uh, as well as investments and uh, in advisory products and the technical assistance. So um, IFC, which uh, is an institution that I'm part of, uh, uh, we are currently involved in two initiatives that I'd like to share with you in, uh, in uh, climate mitigation, climate resilience, both uh, uh, intersecting with each other or intertwined with each other. Next slide, please. Um, this is the initiative that uh, is about to be uh, released uh, very soon, and uh, the teaser is coming out in the mining mining in Daba next week. Um, and uh, with this, we're focused on uh, creating net zero, net zero transition roadmaps for uh, copper and nickel value chains. Primary, we chose these minerals primarily because uh, because the role that they play in the energy transition. Copper and nickel are the most cross-cutting critical minerals of the uh, of the entire uh, low carb carbon economy uh, and part of the 18 minerals that are identified as critical for uh, for low carbon future. So um, while total mining sector accounts for uh, close to 10% of global emissions, um, we see significant demand uh, in uh, growing for copper and nickel and emissions intensity also growing up, uh, going up. So. Um, a lot of companies have, a lot of mining companies have committed to net zero, going net zero by 2050 or earlier. Um, so with this work, what we are trying to do is help mining companies um, create robust targets uh, and not only give them a technology roadmap, but, uh, but also the enabling environment roadmap, which involves regulation, um, ESG considerations, just transition plans, land use impacts of various technologies, as well as collaborative uh, initiatives that are required to meet the goals. And finally, to identify the right financial uh, products and, uh, um, and incentives to, uh, to enable that transition, to, to, get to, uh, to get to their targets. So as an example, I'm gonna show you in the next slide um, that uh, we do have the technologies right now available to meet to, to mitigate 90% of the emissions. Um, in next slide, please. Um, and up and down the value chain, uh, close to 90%. And this looks at uh, uh, techno-economic analysis of various technologies available right now in short, medium, and long term, uh, based on affordability, availability, and accessibility of, of various technologies. Now, not all these technologies have similar or same ESG impact, um, just um, impact on on uh, on uh, on communities, land use impact, etc. So this is where uh, the roadmap will look at various impacts of these different technologies and both positives and negatives, and uh, help create robust roadmap for uh, roadmaps for the mining companies. Um, and I'm happy to expand on uh, the net zero roadmap work uh, later, or I'm happy to share that when it comes out uh, next week or uh, in the weeks uh, following uh, next week. But uh, I'll introduce uh, another project that we're uh, closely involved in uh, in the next slide, uh, which is looking at community climate resilience in critical mineral value change, which is uh, which follows uh, the the work of uh, the net zero roadmaps. So the way we look at uh, both the work streams is at two, coin, two sides of the same coin, which is climate mitigation, and climate adaptation, but intertwining each other uh, at various various points. So through this work, we are looking at the aspects that uh, Veronica and, uh, uh, and Anthony mentioned, which is to really help companies diagnose climate risk uh, properly. Companies are really good at identifying um, hazards and uh, and uh, 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 and uh, um, and identifying 
uh, impact to hazards, but not so great at uh, understanding the underlying vulnerabilities. So with this work, we are going to help um, guide the companies to create robust risk management systems to understand the underlying vulnerabilities uh, in the host communities through their operations. And the second would be for uh, to enable companies to create resilience roadmaps um, to build better adaptive capacity um, in, in the company operations and the frontline communities. And the third goal is to help them set targets, resilience targets, uh, measurable targets that are based uh, science based and uh, um, and help them adopt those targets and uh, and invest in that in those targets. And this is where the as a financial institution, institution we can help them invest in these interventions, resilience interventions all, all along the way. And next uh, next slide, which is going to be my last last slide is those are just two projects that we're involved in, but uh, um, IFC has uh, in recent years has developed a very climate focused um, uh, practice through our sustainable deal linked financing platform where we create incentives for uh, companies, not just mining sector, but all in infrastructure uh, sectors, um, companies in infrastructure sectors to um, to create robust sustainability strategies, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. Um, and what that involves is decarbonization pathways, risk and resilience roadmaps and just transition plans. Now, uh, in practice, how does it look like? So they would have to bench uh, baseline their current emissions, base uh, baseline their current resilience plans where they look uh, where they stand at with local communities, and uh, they have to benchmark with peers and industry, um, and uh, currently and also for the future. And in the end, they have to set themselves robust targets to achieve uh, uh, to uh, achieve to meet the uh, roadmap plans, and. Finally, we help them with in uh, incentives such as um, interest rate, you know, increases or decrease in interest rates, as you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, I, I give you a lot, so I'll let you respond uh, uh, to, to that. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Krishna, for for letting us in there on on how the IFC works to enhance uh, risk management and build resilience inside mining companies and within the the local communities. And some of the words that you mentioned there are guidance and advice and roadmaps. And I, I maybe that those are like the the carrots right at the disposal of international financial institutions such as yours. And you call them incentives. And I was just wondering a little bit about, you know, what the sticks could be and is that, you know, would that be disclosure requirements and really then where you see the role of institutions like yours, um, is that more wielding the carrot or the stick? Uh, we see the best uh, best possible way to affect change is, is, is the carrot approach, um, whereas there is certainly a role, to, uh, role for uh, for the stick stick approach, particularly through regulations, intense uh, regulations, which we also help uh, guide, uh, create, um, helping the governments, local governments and local regulator, uh, regulators. For instance, um, we work closely with mining communities and you know, wherever multiple mining communities are pre present. Mongolia is a good example that was brought up uh, before in uh, in the in the report. Um, we helped uh, convene local stakeholders, the governments, and uh, and multiple mining companies to create uh, to look at water issues there. Mongolia is a water intensive region in the South Gobi region specifically, and uh, we helped companies uh, or we helped uh, companies build capacity to translate that information to. To, uh, to the communities, whereas we help the, the local governments create structures and standards for local uh, local communities as well as companies uh, to be able to understand the water and water data, uh, as well as the importance of sharing data and having a, an open dialogue between the communities and companies. Um, we also have a program that focused on uh, disclosure development where we enable companies to um, to create open data plans and allow community members to participate in data gathering as well as uh, to look at their practices. And uh, lastly, another program that I would like to share, uh, two programs actually I'd like to share. One is not from mining, which is uh, hydro communities benefit sharing. Um, Anthony brought this up and we 
uh, my team, sustainable infrastructure team, specifically specializes in benefit sharing and stakeholder engagement uh, programs um, in all infrastructure, specifically also mining. And uh, we helped uh, a lot of hydropower projects in uh, our hydropower developers in, in Nepal to create benefit sharing programs that meet the local shared requirements for the community for uh, for the government in uh, in in the hydro sector. And the last program I'd like to share is uh, is the one that uh, we are involved in uh, in in Peru, where we helped uh, the mining company um, to help um, be part of. Uh, uh, part of a local economic, economic development called this shared value platform where uh, the revenues generated by the mining companies will be uh, managed properly by the local government, also meets the needs of the community, um, both uh, climate impacts to address some of the climate impacts, but also uh, broader uh, community impacts there. So um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Krishna. And, and um, we have one question here from the audience from uh, Daniel Fjellborg at Luleå University, which uh, goes also a little bit to the maybe to this stick question or to the question of who has leverage. And this is a question to Maria Therese. Um, you mentioned that company action is driven largely by investors, but what in, or who drives the investors? and whether the interviews um, have given any indications on this. Maria Therese, would you like to take this question? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your question. Um, I think that from our, what we find in our study is that investors are very concerned about the physical climate risk for the mining industry. Uh, that they they really see that the there are extreme weather events, there are water scarcity that pose a, a severe um, risk for the companies. That's what we found. But I think that also like what what we have seen in the mining industry and and also in your own research that social conflicts and and protests play a very important role in incentivizing companies to change their behavior in producing institutional reform and also influencing investors, like in the case that Krishna was talking about in Mongolia. There, uh, IFC's um, strict demands on, on Rio Tinto to deal with the water scarcity was preceded by community mobilizations that put that made it more or less necessary to, to deal with this situation and that also created a situation where there was very strict governmental regulations. So I think that there could be these kind of impacts also on civil society mobilization. But what I see as a, as a problem in this case, a quite severe problem, is that there is, in contrast to, to, we know that there is a lot of social conflict in the mining industry. It's also almost, um, yeah, uh, so, so there is a lot of social conflict in the, in the mining industry in general. But in on this topic, on, on climate risk, when we ask companies to what extent they, they see that there is uh, um, questions or demand from local communities related to climate impact, there is very little discussions within civil society. And I think that there, there is a risk that this kind of topic is defined in by voluntary standards. It's also defined in multilateral spaces where there is an urgency to solve this low carbon transition, which could create the risk for these sort of sacrifice zones that Tony were mentioning. Uh, because, and I think that therefore we need to talk much more about adaptation because we need to shift the focus because, and not only talk about mitigation because we miss an important part of the impacts on the ground that certain populations will will have to pay a disproportionate burden of, of, of this transition if we do not talk more about the adaptation. I think that that that's important to, to really shift focus to to um, ensure sort of just transition or or make sure. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Terias, and at uh, two minutes to uh, 1500, it is uh, time to close this webinar. Thank you so much to our panelists, uh, to you and the audience for your interest, your participation in this uh, conversation on what might be a fairly new, uh, certainly very interesting uh, topic. Thank you, Maria Terias and Isabella for your report.
uh, which uh, was not only interesting, it's also a really good read, so I can warmly recommend it. You can find that report on the Mistra Geopolitics website, where you will also be able to find the recording of this webinar. I think we can take away from the discussion that um, the private sector is taking uh, responses to climate risks that they are so far uh, fairly focused on the risks to their business and maybe less on the risks that might um, result uh, impact communities, that there is a need um, to build community resilience and that other actors um, might have to come in there that the business and the private sector is not the only one that can manage and address these risks and build community resilience that um, there is a room for for governments on, on different levels for international um, institutions and also for civil society thank you so much um, for attending this webinar 1500 um, on on the dot and uh, thank you very much. Goodbye from us at Stockholm Environment Institute and um, from me, Andrea Lindblom.